from forcing death grips to end their set early after constantly harassing them with plastic water bottles and glow sticks on stage, to quite literally releasing their bodily fluids all over the venue floor within the mosh pit, it seems the death grips fan base has reached a level of degeneracy and infamy in terms of their negative reputation that has cemented them as one of the worst fan bases in music. Despite this being a common opinion, this hasn't always been the case, with death grips having a similarly die-hard fan base for over 10 years now, without this horrendous reputation that they've now formed. Forming in 2010, it seems Death Grips has continued to increasingly intrigue underground music fans since their first set of releases in 2011. Despite this, the band has had their fair share of ups and downs throughout their tenure, which perhaps may see its worst point within the near future, with the Death Grips fanbase only becoming more vile and ravenous as time goes on. So why has this happened? Why has a group as talented and unique as Death Grips attracted such a weird fanbase? In order to find out why Death Grips has a fan base that despite being extremely passionate seem to only cause issues for the band and their image, we need to explore the band's history and the factors that made them so popular in the first place. In order to explore the origins of Death Grips, we first need to explore what I see as the heart and soul of the group, drummer Zach Hill. Hill would begin playing drums at age 14 after apparently hearing voices in his head urging him to pick up the instrument. He would quickly oblige, purchasing a cheap DT beginner drum kit. Zach Hill would begin playing fast-paced punk, although didn't have the ability to play the way in which he wanted to at first. Despite this, he would become obsessed, utilising the kit as an outlet to release any negative emotions. As Hill matured as a musician, he would go on to work on hundreds of projects and become recognised as one of the best math rock drummers on the planet, and this was before the other members of Death Grips had even met. Hill's style is entirely based on sensation and feeling, he just basically goes f***ing berserk, which has often resulted in various injuries including broken fingers, torn eyelids and even injuries. He has stated that he consistently feels immense pain whilst playing the drums, although enjoys the feeling of pushing himself to his absolute limit. After playing in math rock bands such as Hella for a good number of years, Zach Hill would decide he wanted to move into a more abrasive hip-hop direction, although needed an MC to spit bars over his percussion. Zach Hill would begin speaking to his neighbour at the time, Stephen Burnett, also known as MC Ride. Despite Ride being extremely introverted and reclusive at first, the two would hit it off when discussing music music, and began trading black metal demo tapes. At the time, Ride's life consisted entirely of delivering pizzas and creating art through his paintings within his dimly lit house. Although around 10 years prior to Ride and Hill meeting, he had attempted to start a rap career, specifically rapping just some weird shit over experimental beats. This prompted Hill and Ride to explore the idea of starting a sort of experimental rap collective together. Hill decided to introduce Ride to recording engineer and electronic producer Andy Morin, also known as Flatlander. The three would find common ground creatively, resulting in the birth of Death Grips. A year after their formation, the band would release their debut EP, with their full-length debut Ex Military coming a month later. At this point, the band were beginning to receive positive attention, and a fan base began to form, although it was a far cry from what the fan base would become. At this point, the fan base was entirely underground, mainly consisting of people who looked like this, or maybe even perhaps this. Despite being a primarily underground artist, Ex Military had captured the attention of enough individuals within the industry for the band to be signed to Epic Records, you know, Avril Lavigne and Michael Jackson's label. You know, looking back, it does seem like a bit of an odd fit. The band's first release on the label would be their debut album, The Money Store, which took the harshness of Ex Military and added a sheen and polish that widened its appeal. The Money Store would be universally praised by critics, although it would be one particularly barrel-headed reviewer that would permanently alter the perception of Death Grips and their fan base forever, although we're not quite there yet, so we'll get back to that. Despite the Death Grips fan base still being very much underground, there was a huge demand for a large scale tour. The band would oblige, announcing a nationwide tour of the US. They then proceeded to cancel quite literally every single date before going back into hiding. As agreed by Epic Records, the band was set to release two albums on the label. In 2012, the band would reveal a release date for their new project, No Love Deep Web. All seems pretty standard, so things would begin getting a little bit weird around October 1st when the band would tweet about how the label were unwilling to confirm a release date for the record. They also explained how the audience members were going to be able to hear the record at the same time as the label. Shortly after this, the band released the entire album to SoundCloud for free, with Zach Hill's erect 
slapped on the cover. They would of course be promptly released from Epic Records, with the band going on to form Third World Records. And you know what that means? Full creative control. This led to many incidents of the band trolling the f*** out of concert organisers, journalists and of course their own fan base. The band would consistently no-show concerts, with their Lollapalooza concert just consisting of a toy drum kit and a fan's note on the stage. Incidents like this essentially caused much of the fan base's initial bad behaviour, with many shenanigans from the band resulting in the crowd, storming the stage and destroying all the equipment. The band would even announce their disbandment in 2014, with every upcoming show being cancelled once again, only to randomly release an instrumental album named Fashion Week in 2015. It's obvious that all these shenanigans are only going to rile up a fan base that was beginning to increase in size exponentially thanks to the previously mentioned barrel-headed, glasses-looking-ass motherfucker Anthony Fantano. If you're a consumer of music-related content on YouTube, you're probably already aware of who Fantano is and why his opinion remains so prolific within the chronically online music landscape. Starting in the mid-2000s as a radio host, Fantano would quickly shift his attention to the internet, releasing written album reviews that would eventually be accompanied by videos. His YouTube channel would begin to quickly explode in popularity, with Fantano building a fan base of music nerds who took much of what he said as gospel and fact. One thing that should be known is during Fantano's peak of popularity and relevance around 2016, he was very much a fan of meme culture, which made him extremely appealing to a more troll-oriented side of the internet, meaning many of his opinions have in turn become memes. So what does Fantano have to do with Death Grips and their popularity? Well, he has consistently given them outstanding reviews, with the Money Store being one of the few tens given out by Fantano at the time of Death Grips' explosion of popularity. As Fantano's popularity began to grow, so did his influence over what became considered quote-unquote good within online music communities, with Death Grips being one of the main examples. When much of your fan base is coming from just one community, which at the time was inherently linked to a more troll, degenerate side of music internet, it's obvious you're going to get some bad apples, resulting in Death Grips and their fan base beginning to see a negative reputation around this time. This mainly came in the form of ridicule towards the fan base for meat riding this mother to oblivion, which obviously obviously isn't as bad as having a fan base that urinates in concerts. So you may be wondering at this point, Fantano had also given tens to the likes of Kendrick and Swans at the time of Death Grips' explosion in popularity, so how come they didn't receive a similar treatment? Well I believe it has a lot to do with the band's image and history. Look at this music video, look at this, this concert footage. It's all very strange, visually interesting and most importantly has large amounts of meme appeal and potential, with the internet's fascination with the group largely spreading due to memes and jokes about some of the band's many quirks. This has continued as the years have progressed, resulting in the notorious chronically online fanbase, which I suppose is expected with or without the memes. Death Grips have a very distinct and aggressive sound, and are never going to be appealing to the vast majority, which often results in fans that are forced to the internet in order to discuss details on their favourite band. Despite all of this, any Death Grips show prior to their recent tour has never resembled the absolute degeneracy of their 2023 tour. Fans have truly been ravenous, pissing in the mosh pit, being so violent that crowd members have received various major injuries, forcing the band to end the show early after pelting glow sticks at MC Ride, and worst of all dressing in this outfit. So why has the fanbase suddenly become so bad now despite always consisting of a similar demographic? Well in my eyes there are a few reasons, one of which being the prevalence of social media such as TikTok and the echo chambers that come with that. Many fandoms nowadays see themselves subject to this, being unable to see any other point of view, with the same memes, jokes and information bouncing around their f***ing brain. This means many young fans that have already lost three years of brain development thanks to COVID are looking at social media, seeing the average individual in a Neopunk FM concert video or TikToks of people playing subway surfers during a performance and actually thinking that's how you're supposed to act at shows, resulting in these fans attending these concerts and trying to replicate or even one-up what they've seen online. Self-importance amongst these individuals has also reached a new high, main character syndrome if you'd like. Concert go 
powers are no longer happy to just be spectators. They need to somehow be a part of the action, and if that means throwing bottles at the artists like they're freaking animals in a zoo, that is what they'll do. Another issue that has been worsened by social media is post-concert etiquette. During the pandemic, concert footage began to go viral, leading to many individuals becoming interested in music and live shows that wouldn't have been beforehand. Concert goers no longer want an engaging show that they can just view. They want viral moments and parasocial relationships. This has obviously affected concerts all over the world. So if it affects all concerts, why are Death Grips fans perceived to be the worst? Well, it's essentially a combination of everything I've mentioned prior in this video, all wrapped up in a nice little package. Death Grips are incredibly unique and interesting, both visually and audibly, attracting a more alternative fan base that has been combined with a huge portion of their popularity, stemming mainly from memes and the more chronically online sections of the internet, all culminating in horrendous concert stories thanks to a culture that seems to reward degeneracy and bad behaviour with yummy internet points. Obviously, all of those warning signs point to alternative rap fans pissing all over concert venues. Like, realistically, we probably should have seen this all coming.